This is the Couchbase 102 SDK operations. In Couchbase 101, we covered, um, you know, the sort of the fundamental architecture of Couchbase and understanding, um, you know, how Couchbase works under the hood, uh, the RAM cache and disk writing and, and etc. Um, and monitoring of Couchbase. And in Couchbase 102, we're going to cover sort of the SDK operations, you know, sort of getting set up with the SDK, understanding how um, the SDK connects to Couchbase, um, and all the basic operations. Um, this is particularly useful for those that are completely new um, to Memcached, um, uh, API, and Couchbase. Um, you know, this will give you a sort of a solid understanding. Um, and the next webinar is Couchbase 103, where we talk more specifically about document modeling um, and taking it a little further. Uh, so this is a pretty full session, but we will um, definitely make time for questions um, during the middle of the presentation and at the end. So let's get started. Um, oh, and uh, if any at any time you have any questions, you can always email uh, webinar. I'm sorry, webinars at catchbase.com and um, or you can email me directly, just deep at catchbase.com. And of course, I'm always uh, available on Twitter uh, at Scalable. So let's get started. So the first thing, um, you know, after installing Catchbase itself is, you know, setting up your SDKs. So we support, you know, quite a variety of uh, um, languages out there. You know, Java and .NET, PHP, Ruby, Python, C, Node.js. We do actually have um, clients for other languages as well. Um, and if you go to catchbase.com slash communities, you can see links to all the getting started and tutorial guides um, for each language. And um, for other community clients in other languages, on the left-hand side, um, you can uh, scroll down and look for all clients. And you'll see links to um, GitHub repos for Go and Erlang, Clojure, Tickle, Perl, and others. Those are community clients, um, but uh, actually some of them are made by our uh, engineers as well. One of the uh, important things to understand for uh, PHP, Ruby, and Python is that those uh, SDK clients are wrappers around the uh, C library, libcouchbase, and so you have to install libcouchbase first. Um, and it's always important to remind people about that. Um, you know, when you're doing your install, of course, the getting started side, uh, uh, getting started guide, um, you know, ex you know, talks about that as well as the first step is getting started with. The catch base. Um, Java and .NET have native um, SDKs, and actually the Node.js, as of the last uh, release, includes the lib catch base within the npm install. So um, I encourage you to read the getting started guides and, and the tutorial app um, for each SDK. It helps you um, get started as well as you know the content in this webinar. So for installing libcouchbase, you're going to go to, you know, communities slash C slash getting started. And then for uh, uh, Mac users, it's, it, you know, important to have Xcode and uh, command line tools installed. Um, install Homebrew if you're not using it already. And of course, you know, update your Homebrew. Homebrew makes, you know, installations really easy on uh, Macs, um, you know, for all kinds of libraries. And we use Homebrew for installing libcouchbase on Macs. So for you know PHP, Ruby, and Python, you're gonna want to get and do the getting started for the C library. Um, on PC and Windows, you'll go to that page and you'll download the appropriate zip file from the from our website uh, on the uh, getting started page for C. Um, and we have versions for different versions of Windows and Visual Studio, etc. Um, Red Hat and CentOS and Ubuntu is a pretty standard. Um, you know, procedure, you get the repository first and then you do a sudo yum install or apt-get install. Um, and of course on Mac it's brew install lib Couchbase. So Couchbase server, we have a number of different ports um, that we open up um, between the application server and, um, and, and Couchbase server. Of course on your local machine, um, you know, these ports will already be open. Um, unless you have firewall set up, you'll need to open these ports. Um, so when the application server connects to Couchbase, it creates a uh, persistent HTTP connection to the port 8091 to get the cluster configuration and the cluster partition map uh, that we talked about in Couchbase 101. Um, 
port 8091 is also the port where you administer Couchbase, uh, and you can monitor Couchbase. So if you open that up in your browser, you know, as part of your setup, that's also port 8091. Um, and once we get the cluster configuration and the partition map, we now know all the different IP addresses in Couchbase um, cluster. So if you have multiple machines, we all now we know all the different machines that make up the cluster, and we'll create persistent connections, um, binary socket connections to each node in the cluster. So that's the second step. Once it's retrieved the configuration and the map, um, it'll create a um, you know a persistent uh, binary socket connection to port 11 to 10 um, on each node of the Couchbase cluster. We still, uh, um, I'm sorry, for view querying, we query against port 8092. Of course, the you know SDKs already know this, so you're just doing a query within the SDK itself. But you can actually do queries um, against Couchbase yourself, you know, by curling it or or, or using Postman and, and Google Chrome to, you know, query your, your views, um, and that'll be at port 8092. And that is not a persistent connection; that is uh, a connection that is created for each query. Um, and then finally, we've got um, our backwards compatibility for Memcached at 11 port 211. And on the server side of that, um, it's basically running what's called Moxie in front of Catchbase server. And Moxie it, does uh, the equivalent of what the Couchbase SDKs are doing, which is it'll it'll retain the cluster map of nodes within the Couchbase cluster, and redirect requests um, to the appropriate server um, in the same fashion that the SDKs are doing it from the application server. It'll redirect requests, um, and this is just for um, backwards compatibility. It'll you know we use Moxie to um, basically act like the Couchbase SDKs in terms of going directly to nodes. So each application server will, you know, go directly to the nodes within the cluster responsible for the key, um, you know, with the key hashing that we do, and, you know, we talked about in Couchbase 101. Um, also, yes, as I mentioned, the admin console is on port 8091, so if you put that in your browser, you can monitor your Couchbase as well. So the next step would be to make a connection, and making a connection in each SDK is um, pretty straightforward. Um, in the Ruby version here, we have you know Couchbase.connect, and we provide the bucket name and the uh, host name. Of course, default and localhost are defaults um, for Couchbase.connect. In this case, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm creating a hash. Um, of a couple values, I'm adding that to Couchbase, and then I'm retrieving it back and outputting it. Um, you know, it's a simple require Couchbase, and then uh, you know, make a connection, add, you know, do an add operation, do a get operation. With uh, Python, it's very similar. Um, you know, we're we're doing the same sort of operation here. It's a Couchbase dot connect. Um, you know, we made it very similar on purpose. Um, so you know, here we're doing a catchbase.connect, we're providing the bucket, you know, we're creating a hash, um, adding the data and retrieving the data back and printing it out. Uh, in Java, as usual, it's a little bit more verbose. What we're doing is adding a number of hosts into a uh, uh, list, and um, in that case, we're actually putting the IP address in port and slash pools. Um, we have to have more uh, a, a, a more complete URI there. Um, and then we create a Couchbase client. Um, we provide the list as well as the bucket name, and um, we put a blank password in uh, because default doesn't have a SASL password. Um, and then for um, transcoding of JSON um, back and forth, uh, unlike Ruby and Python where we built it into the SDK, in Java you specify a JSON transcoder uh, yourself, and there's uh, over a dozen popular, um, you know, JSON transcoders. Um, the Google JSON library is a particularly popular one, um, and um, pretty fast. And so, in this case, I'm creating a hash table with a few values, um, and then I'm um, transcoding that into JSON, um, and in the add operation uh, using the, the, you know, the JSON library, I'm, you know, doing JSON 
dot to JSON and sending it the, the hash table. And then when I do a get, it's actually going to print the string JSON out. I'm not actually um, transcoding it back in this little example here into a hash table. I'm just printing it out. Um, and then in, in Java, we also kind of shut down our connection to Couchbase as well is a sort of standard procedure. So a little bit more um, verbose than Ruby and Python, but they're pretty much the same sort of scenario here, making a connection. Um, sending a uh, data, creating data, you know, transcoding into JSON, and then pulling it back out of Couchbase. And in this case, it's still a JSON string because I didn't um, you know, transcode it back uh, into a hash table. But it, that's pretty straightforward, too. Um, and then Node.js, uh, you know, JSON is a sort of first-class citizen in Node.js, so um, uh, under the hood, we're not actually doing any transcoding uh, to and from JSON. It can handle JSON. It's sort of built into Node.js. Um, so in this case, we're doing a, a very similar thing. We're doing a require on Couchbase. We're creating a connection. We're creating, a, you know, a, a hash for data. We're adding and you know, retrieving it back and outputting it to console. Uh, and PHP, as you can see, is very similar as well. Um, you know, so for all these libraries. You know, the syntax is, you know, sort of native to the language, but as you can see, it's all pretty familiar from language to language. Um, you know, you're creating a connection and then adding data and then, you know, retrieving it back. Um, so let's talk through the operations and we'll kind of do some comparisons as well to um, um, relational databases, although in, we'll go a little bit deeper in the um, um, Couchbase 103 in the document modeling will kind of do a little bit stronger comparison there. So, you know, Couchbase operates like a key value document store. We can store simple data types as you can expect. Um, we can also store um, blobs and binary data as well. Um, we can store complex data types like I showed um, with uh, that example. I can show, I can do uh, dictionaries and hashes and array lists, et cetera, and they can be nested, of course. And, you know, JSON is just a special class of string for, um, you know, being able to describe um, complex data structures and simple data structures. Um, you know, as we talked about all the time, schema is unenforced in Couchbase. That means we don't actually have a schema definition system. Um, it's implicit in your model in the way that you encode your model and, you know, your objects, et cetera, if you're using objects or using a functional language, you won't have objects there, but, um, you know, it's implicit in your model, meaning that schema uh, is implicit in your object model, in your object layer. Um, so when you make schema changes, you can make them dynamically and programmatically, and rather than having to um, do the extra step of um, taking, you know, like in your relational database, you would take the database down, you would, you know, do an alter table and change the schema definition. You might need to do a migration um, as well, and then you'll have to bring the um, database back up, and then you can continue working. Well, with Couchbase, what's excellent and, and really fun and interesting and faster is that you don't actually have to do all those steps. You can just change your model and, um, you know, add more values to your JSON documents, you know, and, and reduce the amount of development time especially, and, you know, this is especially good for new projects and startups where you can, you know, change your mind and change your definitions really quickly on the fly um, simply by changing your object model and not having to worry too much about, you know, the changing schema. Um, there's also the other advantage if you're integrating with third-party services that return JSON, which almost all of them do now, um, you know, you can store that JSON directly into Couchbase without having to create a complex schema to represent it. Um, and this can be, you know, a huge time saver. Like when you're getting data from Facebook or Twitter and they have these, you know, very large JSON results sets um, for your queries, you know, creating a schema might take you days, you know, to, to do that, you know, you know, just from the sheer, you know, annoyance of having to do it. Um, you know, those, those JSON documents are quite large and complex, and it takes a lot of time to normalize them properly um, in a relational system. But with Couchbase, you can actually store that JSON directly into Couchbase. Um, and of course, you know, you're...
keys that exist in one for one user and don't exist for another user, like like a second phone number or a second address, for instance, or a second email address. Maybe they have multiple email addresses, you know. And in one case, it's it's just a simple string, um, you know, email address. And in another case, it's an array of email addresses as your JSON value. Um, you know, for your JSON key email. So it can vary from document to document. So these are our store and retrieval operations. You know, we have get for retrieving. Um, we have three different um, storage operations that set, add, and replace. You know, add and replace are just variations on set. And that add is you're sort of expecting uh, that key to not exist in Catchbase, and you'll get an exception if it does. And then for replace, you're expecting to replace an existing document. Um, and if it doesn't exist, you're going to get an error or exception. Um, and in those cases, actually, I, I tend to use add and replace much more often than I use set, because set will always overwrite what's there if it exists already. And I want to be able to determine that I have maybe um, flaws in my application logic. You know, if I'm creating a user and I use set, um, maybe I should have been using add so that I can know that that user actually existed already and I might have had a flaw in my logic somewhere. It also allows me to know, like if I'm checking usernames, if I'm using usernames as key, if I do an add and it exists already, that means somebody else has already taken up that username. So add and replace I use far more often. And then compare and swap or CAS is a basically a an operation and it's called optimistic concurrency we don't actually have to lock documents so anytime you do a storage operation we generate a long integer called a cas value that represents its current state so if you do another like replace operation and change the document um, or you do a touch operation and change the expiration it's going to generate a new cas value and we're going to talk about that we're going to show you, I'm going to show you sort of a animation on that. So if, when I want to do a replace operation, I'm assuming that this value, you know, this document hasn't changed since the last time I retrieved it, and I submit my CAS value with my replace operation, and if it matches, it, you know, proceeds with the replace operation. If it doesn't match, that means some other process has modified that document in the, in the time between my get and my replace operation. Um, and this allows you to, without any locking or any server resources required, um, you know, heavy server resources, you know, things like locking, you know, or, you know, in relational systems or, you know, the mutex locking is, is, a, is actually a significant um, slowdown for relational databases. Um, you know, without that, without needing that, I can actually do, you know, sort of optimistic concurrency. We do have pessimistic concurrency too with uh, get and lock where you can actually lock a document. But optimistic concurrency usually solves like more than 90% of uh, uh, all use cases in terms of concurrency. So um, we also have atomic counters in Catchbase. Atomic counters are simply, you know, values that are integers, uh, positive integers. Um, and um, so you can do increment and decrement on those, and those are executed in order atomically. They're atomic within a cluster, so they're not atomic across clusters um, if you're using cross data center replication, but they are uh, atomic within the cluster. Um, and they're always executed in order, and they're very useful for key patterns. They're very useful for keeping track of, you know, balances or points and things like that. Um, they're, they're, they're relatively unique to Couchbase in, in, in the NoSQL world and in the SQL world. Um, you know, these are very useful um, things to be able to use, and they can be used really creatively. So we have increment and decrement. Of course, you can also, you know, have different deltas and, you know, increment by 10 at a time and, you know, or whatever it is. Um, and then we also have these what I call non-JSON operations, and that's prepend and append. Um, those are basically uh, ways, the operations on strings, um, and you can, you know, you know, basically prepend or append to a value that's a string. Um, the reason they're non-JSON operation is is if you uh, append a string to the uh, to the um, end of a JSON document, 
past the last curly brace, while it's technically still valid JSON, most transcoders um, will ignore after the final brace, after the closing brace. So you have that opening and closing um, curly braces, and if you append a string after that final curly brace, most transcoders actually will ignore it. Um, so um, you can do it, it's just, uh, you know, I don't think it'll uh, be transcoded properly. But it is useful for maintaining um, simple collections, actually. You could, you know, have a, a delimiter in there um, and, uh, you know, append a quick list with a delimiter and split on that into an array in your application. There are a lot of things you can kind of do um, with append and prepend. And these are, um, you know, sort of non-JSON operations. Um, so um, there are actually a few questions, and let me go ahead and answer uh, a few, Franco, and then I'll go through sort of all these operations and how they work, and then I'll kind of um, add a, another question session probably uh, uh, two-thirds of the way in. Yes. So the first question is um, if you can have two different versions, let's say 2.0.1 and 2.2 .2 of Couchbase on the same box. Of the actual Couchbase server? Um, yeah, two different versions of Couchbase coexist, basically. Um, I'm not really sure why you would do that. <laughs> I, I guess if you want to try and simulate a cluster with on one machine, um, I, I believe you can. I, I, I think between those two versions, there, there won't be a problem. Um, you know, you'll have to understand how to create all the different um, port mappings. Um, uh, it's a little bit complex. I think there's someone who created some Python script for doing that, but um, um, generally speaking, you only you know run one instance of Couchbase per machine. Um, uh, and um, <laughs> thank you, Steve. We have a it's very not a question. <laughs> a very interesting question from Binu. And this is kind of a big differentiation from us and other NoSQL solution. So how the locking mechanism works? Uh, is it at the database level or at the document level? How does that work for Couchbase? Ah, yeah, that, that's a great question. No, it's definitely not at the uh, DB level. Um, it is at the document level. If you do a get and lock operation, um, it'll lock that one particular document um, um, for modifications. And it has, we have two settings. One is the default timeout, um, and I believe that that's 30 seconds. And then you can also specify a timeout for how long it'll stay locked, and it's only per document. Um, so we, we can do optimistic, and that's called pessimistic concurrency, where you actually lock the document. We can do optimistic and pessimistic concurrency, and they're on single documents at a time. Of course, a pessimistic is a, an actual lock on a document, um, so it's a you know, it's not significant, but it's more significant than the optimistic concurrency where you just use the CAS value. Great, thank you. And uh, another question from Bo is a development question. So if you want to modify or update a few items in a document, uh, can you write a Java or any other code uh, uh, that helps you achieve that instead of having to manually find the document uh, and update a particular field? Oh, you mean partial updates of um, par partial updates of documents? Uh, no, we actually only do, um, you know, we only transfer entire documents to and from Couchbase server to your client. So you can't do partial updates exactly, but you can, you know. I mean, that's sort of a tricky question. I mean, you can write, you know, code that only modifies parts of a document, um, but it is going to still transfer the entire document back and forth between the application server and Cashbase. Um, we don't have a partial update um, where uh, you submit just the JSON key you want to modify within the JSON document, and then within Cashbase server, it modifies only that JSON key. That uh, We don't work that way. Okay, and let's do one more, and then we we leave some time at the end for more questions. Yeah. Um, so and we covered this a little bit in Couchbase 101, but maybe we want to reiterate: how do you how do we save binary data like files, images, PDF? This is a question that comes very often. Right. 
Yeah, so um, as you you know see here, you've got like you know a key and value um, in the storage operations, and in the value part, you can just store binary data. I mean, there's um, you know within the SDKs, it, basically you're just saying the value is a. So I can um, like let's just say I'm in Ruby, I can pull a JPEG off disk or that was uploaded, and you know into a temporary folder, and then my value actually I can actually be that um, actual binary data. So uh, it's very simple. Um, you know, in relational, you actually had to like uh, create a blob type um, and then save it that way. But for us, it's it's very simple. You know, just the value is just binary. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, resume the presentation, and we'll leave more time at the end for questions. Okay. Sure. No problem. So uh, okay. So retrieval operations. So. As we talked about in Catchbase 101, we are, uh, you know, we still we basically serve almost as much as data as we can out of RAM, and then, so a get operation is so when I do these sort of uh, relational translations over, uh, just you know, be I'm being sort of liberal. It's not exactly the same, but it's just a way to have for people who are completely new to understand you know, these operations, you know, from a relational point of view, but it, it is still different. But in, in, in this case, with this get operation, you know, because we are, operate like a key value store in terms of our structure, we're basically a get operation saying, give me everything, you know, give me the document where the key matches, you know, my key. You know, so if I'm getting on a key, I'm just basically saying a select star where key equals my key. Now the star is actually uh, just a value, and that value is not, you know, it could be a JSON document, and so it has multiple columns and quotes, <laughs> you know, being JSON keys. Um, but we're doing a select star, we're just basically getting the value, and it, and it is served out of RAM cache. Storage operation, so a set here is, you know, kind of like an insert and update because that's where I'm saying I'm translating it over a little bit but you know insert update where the key matches so I'm saying basically if it exists already update it overwrite it but if it doesn't exist insert it um, and once it goes to RAM cache it goes into disk write queue and replication queues and it goes to another node if you have replicas set up or and it goes to disk um, with the IO workers so we decouple our RAM cache serving from um, our disk writing in order to keep, you know, cache base super fast. Now an add operation is a little bit more like an insert operation. And then if it exists already, you know, if we're saying insert the key and value, um, you know, where the key equals value. And again, you know, if it, it, it exists already, it'll, um, it'll, uh, oops, sorry, I hit the wrong key. You know, if it exists already, it'll fail with an exception or error, um, you know, saying, oh, this key already exists. And just like the set, once it goes into RAM cache, it gets added to the, the replication disk write queues and then gets, you know, pushed to another node or and um, pushed to disk. Now, the replace operation, again, very similar to set. In this case, we're, it is much more like an update operation where we're saying, you know, set the key equal to value where the key matches my key. And then um, if it doesn't exist, I mean, sorry, if it, uh, yeah, if it doesn't exist, you know, then it'll say, oh, we, oops, we've got a problem here. You know, it doesn't exist. I can't replace it because it doesn't exist. That key does not exist in Couchbase. Um, so we are a consistent database. So when you do, you know, storage operations, you know, even though it goes to the disk write queue, you can read your own writes and immediately do a get even before it's gotten to uh, disk because it is in the RAM cache. And so, you you know, we are a consistent database. Um, we're not eventually consistent like other NoSQLs. And even, uh, you, know, you know, when you scale up Mongo, for instance, in order to scale up reads, um, you have to actually have uh, replica sets on each shard um, and and those are eventually consistent. So you actually can read old values um, in Mongo, and I, you know, and that can actually cause a lot of problems. And I ran when I used to run, use Mongo, I used to run into a lot of problems with uh, consistency issues on on reads um, because I had to scale it up and I had replica sets on each shard. 
Um, but Couchbase is quite different in that it's a consistent database. You can read your own rights. So let's talk a little bit through uh, the concurrency model. So as I talked about earlier, um, every storage operation, anything that modifies um, a document or its expiration in Couchbase um, generates a long integer value called the, the CAS value. CAS is, you know, it can be either translated as compare and swap or check and set. Um, the acronym is actually, you know, there's, I guess, two different um, definitions of the acronym, but they both mean the same thing. Uh, basically, it just represents almost like an MD5 hash. It represents the current state of the document. And it's like a version number, but it isn't exactly a version number um, in that it just represents the current state. And so then you can use this for opt optimistic concurrency. It's like I, I retrieve the document and, and I have the CAS value. In this case, I'm showing it with the Ruby example. I do, I do extended equals true and I get the, the actual value on the get and I get the CAS value. And then when I do a replace, a subsequent replace operation, I modify, you know, a portion of that um, JSON and then I do a replace on that operation, I submit my CAS. Um, with that replace operation um, because I know that this document might have um, race conditions and I want to ensure that you know only one modifies that document at a time so I submit it with the CAS value and if another process has changed that document in the meantime between the get mutation and replace operations a new CAS will have been generated and so that replace operation will fail Otherwise, if it has not been modified, that CAS value will match and the replace operation will uh, succeed. So let's kind of look through it here. Um, I've got two application servers. The first one is creating a document. And then let's just say both application servers retrieve that document and its current CAS value. All right, so now they both have the same version of the document, um, you know, in memory and they're about to you know, do operations with that document. So in the um, first application server, I'm going to do, uh, you know, replace operation with that CAS value. And when I do a get back, um, and actually in most of the SDKs, when you do the set operation, you can also get the CAS back at the same time. But just for the sake of the animation, I do a get back. And now application server one has modified that document with the CAS value, and now that document has a new CAS value. So now when application server two um, tries to do an operation um, with its CAS value, we've got what's called a CAS mismatch because that document has been modified in that in time frame. And so what it has to do is retrieve that document and then re retry the CAS operation with that. And when it does that, It'll, um, you know, have a new CAS generated, um, and so if we retrieve that back, um, we've got, you know, this new CAS value in both cases. So with pessimistic concurrency, and this is where you sort of get with lock, you know, you're retrieving from the RAM cache, and now that document is locked, and uh, you can do reads during that time while that document is locked, um, but this will fail, you know, because the application server one has locked that document, and it won't be released until you do an operation um, that, um, uh, you know, either replaces that document, which will unlock it by uh, automatically, or it times out. Um, so basically, you know, you're basically, you know, unlocking the document either manually or automatically through the timeout. Now the timeout is can be set when you do that get with lock. Uh, you can say five seconds and I think the default and maximum is 30 seconds. Um, and of course when you do that operation a new CAS will be generated. In general, uh, you know, get with lock is, is for the most part not really necessary except for, you know, a few cases where, you know, you, you need to be absolutely sure, you know, that, uh, you know, this document is modified by one process only and that the optimistic concurrency scenario will not work. 
I mean, there, it's very rare um, to find a scenario where you actually need to actual actual lock on a document. Um, so we can then do a few more questions. I see there's a lot of questions, but let's do a few more questions before I go into expirations, um, and then I can do it just a few more, and then uh, I'll finish up the presentation and at, answer more questions at the end. Uh, yes. So. A question from Vinod. We he would like to have some clarification about those um, uh, those queues, so the replication queues and the disk queues. When do they come into the picture? And can you clarify again what's the difference between the two? Okay, so that was actually um, Catchbase 101 content. I do encourage you, if you haven't seen it, to to watch that one because we we do to specifically talk about um, that architecture. So the the disk write queue and replication queue. For the disk write queue, we decouple our uh, disk I.O. from our, um, and because it's the slowest component um, in any system is disk I.O., we decouple that um, op those operations of storing to disk from our uh, RAM cache so that we can serve data much faster. Now, cache base is an evolution of memcached with a, a lot of added features on top of it, and so we are storing in RAM cache first, and then it gets added to the disk write queue. When it gets to the top of the queue, it gets written to disk, and it's written to disk in an append-only format so that we can actually, it's similar to journaling, but so that we can write as fast as possible um, within Couchbase and get things on disk. Um, so th that's basically how it works. Now, the replication queue is similar to disk write queue, but all it's doing is transmitting documents across the wire to the replica partition on another node. Um, so that's just for failover and failsafe, you know, to have uh, replica partitions. Um, you know, in the case of a failover, those replica partitions become active. So, um, you know, that's basically the architecture of how it works. Thank you. Um, can you say again what is the maximum limit for the, the size of a, for a, of a document, and what do you do to handle a large file, as we said before, like binaries? Uh, the maximum limit is 20 megabytes. But um, in general, when you have very large files, uh, you know, as blobs, uh, you know, there's there are better strategies than storing um, it in in your database of any database, um, whether it's Couchbase or others, you know especially things like video files. I mean, if you have 15 meg, 20 meg video files, and 20 meg is the limit per document, you know, it's much more prudent to use a CDN system for that and keep all the files metadata, like the title, tags, and author, and all those uh, description, all that kind of information in Couchbase, um, and using a sort of CDN for that. Um, you know, but, it, but people do use Couchbase for um, serving up binary data, like, you know, asset files and things like that. And one of the advantages is that it is being served out of RAM, and even S3 is not served out of RAM. So, um, you know, you can get increased performance on asset loading and things like that. Great. Um, another question is about uh, the persistence engine. So what happens if, you know, you uh, do a get of a document, you do a you set a document and the server crashes, um, while the document was still in the replication queue and the, the disk queue. But can you say that again, actually? Yes. What happened if you you do a set of a document, so you add the document to the server, but the server crashes while the document was still in the replication queue and disk queue, so the document uh, was not persisted or it was not replicated yet? Yeah, just like any system, it's, it's impossible to prevent, um, com you know, you know, data loss completely. That is a scenario that, um, you know, if it the operation succeeds, so the client, uh, your SDK client, thinks the operation has succeeded, but before, and it's gotten into RAM cache, you know, and the, therefore the operation succeeded, but then it didn't get into the disk write or replication queues or didn't get drained, and in that very, very tiny window, it's actually quite small, um, the server crashes, there is a potential for a small data loss at that point. Uh, I mean, it's, it's virtually impossible to prevent, you know, any data loss because, uh, you know, I mean, it's just impossible because there are moments in every system where it could crash before, you know, data has been gotten to disk or gotten to 
you know, a replica or, you know, and most people take the a more modern strategy is the cache based strategy of having these sort of replica um, partitions on other nodes and things like that. And obviously we have persistent socket, uh, binary socket connections to each node in the cluster, so replication happens as quick as possible. But there is a tiny window where that is possible, um, you know, and every system pretty much has that. So at least one place where it, uh, it is possible. Thank you. Um, we can do one more question, then we uh, can continue the presentation. I just want to remind everyone that we do um, collect all the questions at the end, um, even those that we don't answer uh, during the session. And yes. Justip has a blog where he answers all the questions uh, within a day or two, and we send the link to the blog on our follow-up email. So if you have any questions, send it out. Even if we don't cover it live, we will answer the question. Yeah, I will answer all questions in, in my uh, follow-up blog post. Um, even questions I've answered, I write up uh, sometimes more detailed answers um, for everybody. To, to and It'll be in the email that uh, Franco sends out. So this last question is from Wani. Um, so you said that you should configure your server to have all the documents in RAM. Uh, but how much performance degradation there will be if we use an SSD disk and uh, lower RAM? Um, well, it, it really depends. I mean, that's a, actually a sort of a tricky question because I can't give a, a generic answer for that. It depends on your write velocity and your write load. Because if you do have um, a lower amount of RAM, what we're going to have to do is uh, eject values from RAM, you know, as your RAM, you know, uh, quota for your bucket gets full. We have to eject them to disk. Um, and if you have a very high write velocity, then both you've got two things trying to compete um, with getting things to disk. One is your ejection mechanism, and the other is just your disk write queue. And so it really depends. With SSD, uh, of course, you know, our, our I.O. is going to be much faster in general. Um, you know, I think even the Fusion I.O. is even faster than that. But, um, you know, and it also depends how many SSDs, if you're doing striping, are you on, you know, Amazon or cloud. I mean, there's so many dependencies to give you a, a you know, a generic answer that works in all occasions. But, it, it, you know, between the white velocity and ejection, it is possible but it, you know, as usual, it depends. It depends. Thank you, Jasdeep. Uh, so again, let's continue the presentation. We'll have a few more minutes at the end. Okay. So expirations. Uh, so we, uh, you know, we are a great, um, you know, addition just like memcached for storing session data, um, and you know, obviously you can swap in Couchbase um, for memcached, and your memcached SDKs for most CMS frameworks will still work fine. Um, you know, and of course, you know, you can use it more directly with Couchbase um, and, you know, like for, for instance in the Ruby and Rails, you know, you can do a simple, I think it's like two lines of code and you can, you know, use Couchbase instead um, using our Ruby SDK and Rails. Uh, so documents do have expirations and, you know, here we have two examples where we're providing a, a, a time to live or TTL um, in in these cases, in one case is Ruby and the other is Java, we're doing 30 seconds. And we do have operations um, for just, you know, touching that value, extending the expiration, and that's just the touch command. And you can also do a get and touch where you actually retrieve it and touch it at the same time. And these operations, like touch and get and touch, um, because you're modifying, you know, your expiration, they do generate new CAS values, just so you understand. So an expiration, you know, very straightforward. Here I'm creating a document with a time to live, and then um, if I do a get operation, oops, sorry, you do a get operation, you know, after it's expired, um, then, you know, it'll return null like it doesn't exist, right? So um, they actually are not deleted. They're tombstoned, um, you know, and then they're deleted when we do online compaction when it comes to on disk. Um, so if that document is written to disk, it will, um, on expiration, it will be tombstoned. Uh, and then when we do compaction, we actually delete um, the files off of disk. Uh, I'm sorry, those documents out of, off of disk. So expired documents are not deleted until off disk until compaction. And this is basically to be more efficient. 
So if I do a touch command here, it's going to update the TTL. I'm going to move a little faster so I can talk about and make sure I talk about everything. This is a pretty full presentation. A lot of questions today. This is great. Um, so we do have what's called observe, and this is for durability requirements that you might have. Um, basically, um, we can do callbacks on operations when uh, certain uh, conditions have been met, and those conditions are that it's been written to disk on the active partition, that it's it, that it's been written written to a replica disk. Now you can use any number of these. You can just do one, or you can do a combination of these. Um, so in this command, uh, the the set add replace here command, uh, I'm observing also that the it's been persisted and it's been replicated. Um, that means it's been persisted on the active or master partition for that key, and then it's also been replicated to another node. And then in Java, we have you know enums for that, and it's persist to dot master and per replicate to one. And those are obviously optional. So if you do um, the second example at the bottom there, in this case, I just want to know when it's been replicated, and that's the durability requirement that I have for this key. Um, and then um, for Java, I just put in the you know replicate to one there. So the way this looks is basically. You know, I'm doing a storage operation. It's going to RAM cache, and then once it's made it to disk, I get a callback that it's complete. Okay, so you know, if you're doing this for every operation, it, you you can imagine you're increasing the latency because you have to wait till it's gotten written to disk before you're going to get that callback. Um, you know, things are done asynchronously, but you know, then you've got all these callbacks. You know, and those can pile up. So you are increasing the latency. So you really want to use durability for when you actually need it for documents that actually need uh, that you know that durability requirement. You know, so you wouldn't do it necessarily for session data because uh, you don't need that, but you might do it for like a particular transaction. You know, um, in you know, so this is available um, where ne necessary, and you have to under if you understand the architecture, you also understand the latency for this. Um, getting to disk is generally takes a little bit longer than getting uh, through replication. Um, of course, this all depends. Like it's not always the case. So I mean, you could have some crazy, uh, you know, Fusion I/O um, devices where replication and getting to disk are almost identical. Replicate two works the exact same way. Goes to RAM cache, replication queue, and then. Once it's um, been acknowledged by the other machine, you get the callback that it is actually um, complete and has um, been replicated. And of course, you can do both um, at the same time. In which case, you're increasing uh, your latency for that callback, you know, because both conditions will have to be met um, before that. So, for the there was a question about like, well, how do I? There is a, that moment where it could crash, you know, where it's gotten to RAM cache but it has not gotten to disk or replication. If, if there's a document that has durability requirements, if you use this along with it, you'll be able to know whether it's been replicated or gotten disk. And therefore, that operation, if the node crashes in that moment, it will not have satisfied the durability requirements, and your client SDK will know that. So um, that's one way of, of basically knowing. Basically, you're going to have that sort of timeout, like the, that you know we didn't get that callback within the time frame. And therefore, it didn't succeed, and you can retry the operation or you know handle it in whatever ways um, you want to do. So I do want to kind of show a few things here, and I can uh, answer questions at the same time. Um, and I actually am going to go through the. If you look in the middle there, um, GitHub.com/slash/CouchBaseLab/slash/DeveloperDay goes through stuff that um, you know I wrote a long time ago. Um, you know, when we were touring around the, the states and, and Europe um, doing uh, full day developer days, um, it really covers all the operations that I've, I've talked about here. Um, and I can uh, kind of answer questions while I kind of show, like in Java, we have, you know, sort of examples that go through storage of regular information storage of binary data, storage of, of um, JSON, um, and atomic counters, CAS, observe, and things like that. Um, and then the Ruby equivalent uh, I have here as well. It's the same files per language, um, you know, where we're kind of going through 
you know, all these operations. And basically, I was going to kind of do them, and you can watch while I do them as I answer questions. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, and again, uh, uh, I want to remind everyone that this is the last chance to send a question before we close the session, and we will follow up to any questions uh, either live on on the blog. And I see a few questions about both views, uh, map reduce, and uh, XDCR. So I want to remind everyone that the Views and indexing session is CalSpace 104, and we will have that next Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific. And uh, XDCR, we will have an entire session on XDCR and Elasticsearch on CalSpace 105, which will be on Monday, December 16. Um, so in which case we need to use the stale mode operation? Stale mode operation. That's views. Uh, so. I mean, that's definitely something we, we, we cover in the views. That has more to do with, um, you know, when the indexers are, you know, updated. And that's kind of a long question for this webinar because we, are, we do cover it um, uh, in the next one. And if you, if you can't wait until next Thursday, you, we do have it on demand on our website that you can also watch it on the Couchbase 104. Perfect. Um, so. You described the CAS uh, operation. So, is there any drawback uh, of using CAS? Uh, no, not at all. I think that it's actually a great, um, a great way to handle race conditions. Um, you know, I wrote like a small amount of code where you know, if a particular um, JSON key in a document uh, has not changed. Um, I can auto retry my CAS operation by doing a get, uh, mutate the document, and then replace. Um, uh, in which case, the you know if my particular portion that I was interested in of a JSON document um, has not been modified by somebody else, you know because of a CAS mismatch, then I, you know I go ahead and automatically uh, retry my operation. Um, you know, I thought that that was kind of cool. I, I, there's really no drawbacks to CAS, um, you know, as far as you know, using it. And then, of course, we do have the get and lock if it's absolutely necessary. But um, for most, I'd say the vast majority of, of race condition handling, you know, CAS is great. Perfect. Uh, another question is: um, Is there a bulk load capability of JSON documents uh, that we can use in CAS-based server? Um, I mean, we do have a talent connector uh, for bulk loading. I mean, this, a couple of the SDKs have a, a multi-set <laughs> uh, where you can kind of add um, documents at a time. But generally, I mean, the operations are so fast, so executing them in order. I mean, there's really no difference uh, between bulk load and that. Um, uh, but there isn't a, within Casper server itself. There isn't like a, you know a bulk load of JSON. I mean, I think actually maybe CB transfer has some capability, um, but I'd have to look it up. I actually haven't uh, I haven't done that with uh, with uh, the CB transfer tool. But I think it might be possible. But it is still doing the same thing as um, you know doing multiple sets or or adds or you know, etc. Essentially, it's the same. It's just you know our command line tool doing the same sort of operations. And another question we have is: um, Can you clarify what is the pools in 1891-pools uh, when you specify that oh, in the Java? Why it's there? <laughs> yeah, there actually is aren't pools. It was uh, you know that was just a syntax that we have not changed. Um, we don't actually have connection pools in general. You, for the most part, in most situations, uh, one connection per app server to Couchbase is is more than sufficient. Um, and you know, you share that even if you do multiple threads, you can do that uh, in, in a shared way uh, across your threads. Um, but uh, yeah, you don't generally need to have um, more than one connection to Couchbase. Um, so, but we did actually have in our syntax of our URIs the ability to have multiple pools. Um, you know, but that's more in the syntax of the URI. Actually, there is no difference. So we, you know, why in Java we have to put slash pools? That's a good question. 
it's it's mostly because it has been there and that we don't want to break um, we don't want to break applications by changing that syntax you know by you know if otherwise people would have to you know change their syntax in all their applications uh, so since that syntax has been there for quite some time um, I think Java was one of our first clients um, you know it's basically just stayed there thank you um, I mean we, if you want to conclude the presentation then we have probably time for one more question yeah let's just go ahead and do one more question uh, live and then I'll answer all the rest uh, on my blog okay so one more question that we can answer is um, so do you know anything about what kind of overhead uh, it will add to use the storage with observe um, capability in cloud space? Well, there's no way to give you like an exact number. Uh, like it's it it add, you know it adds like this much uh, time or this much you know server resource like CPU cycles, but I mean it is. It is something that you don't want to do, like every single operation you do with Couchbase, uh, with Observe, you will not get the sub millisecond, you know, latency performance because you're basically, uh, especially with the persist to like to disk, you're basically going to only be as fast as your disk I/O because you're going to be waiting um, for everything to get on disk um, um, before returning. So. Uh, you know, basically, you don't want to do it for every single operation because most operations don't uh, need to do that, and you don't have the same durability requirements for every single document. Um, you'll be doing it for the ones that you care most about, like particular documents where you want to observe and make sure that it's either been persisted or replicated or both. Um, so there's not a lot of overhead if you're only doing it for some of the documents versus doing it for every single operation. Um, so, uh, you know, it's really you're increasing the latency um, before you get that callback. But it's as far as server resources, it's not heavy. You, you can do a, a, quite a lot of them, I, but I can't. There's no way to give you an exact number because it really depends on, you know, your your setup. You know, in terms of your your CPU, are you on cloud, public cloud, or in your own data center? You know, what kind of machines, how many cores? All those things are all factors in in answering those questions. Thank you. Yes. Um, just want to remind everyone I see a few questions about mobile, and we will have tomorrow uh, our first Couchbase Mobile 101, and we will focus on our Couchbase Lite, the new product uh, on uh, dedicated on for mobile. Um, All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, please leave us some feedback on the session, what you didn't like, what you liked. Uh, and again, we take those comments very seriously. I hope to see you all either tomorrow at Catspace Mobile 101 or next Monday at Catspace uh, 103, which will be data modeling. Thank you, everyone, and I'll see you tomorrow or Monday. Thank you.